Hello and welcome to The Northern Agenda, your weekly dose of politics and public affairs from across the North. Well, the title kind of gives that away just a little bit. This podcast is voiced by journalists who are outside the Westminster bubble, reporting from the other side of the ever-expanding North-South divide. I'm Rob Pot... Well, no, no I'm not. I'm Dan McLaughlin, producer of the podcast, and for one night only, Rob is letting me say hello to mark the Northern Agenda's second birthday. Yep, we've been going since 2019. Three Prime Ministers later, and more cabinet changes than IKEA, our daily newsletter, written by Rob, is still going strong. You can read more about the political stories that really matter to the North and from the North that you won't hear about from the national media in London at the northernagenda.co.uk. A bit later on, our Northern Agenda editor, Rob Parsons, speaks to Dr. Marie O'Brien about the essential role that Liverpool has played in developing life-saving vaccines. But for now, we've got the bunting out, and I've had an asthma attack trying to blow up the balloons. It's our birthday, and of course, the best person to celebrate the occasion with is the person who's been here from the very beginning and is still keeping the Northern Agenda strong. Two years later, it's Rob Parsons. Hello, Rob. Hi, Dan. What an intro. Uh, not, it feels strange to be on the other side of the interview interview process. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's our second birthday. It was uh, April 2021 that the Northern Agenda came into being. And uh, I'm pleased to say we're still still here going strong uh, a full 24 months later. Well, yeah. So like you said, two years in, Rob, um, how would you describe those two years? So, yeah, it's been uh, an incredibly frenetic and dramatic two years of politics, hasn't it? Uh, obviously, when the Northern Agenda started two years ago, uh, in, in April 2021, we were still sort of uh, deep in the pandemic. It was still the dominant sort of issue uh, of the moment. And since then, we've come out of the pandemic and uh, into pretty much straight away into the cost of living crisis, which is is, is now the big thing on on people's minds quite quite understandably and uh we've gone through three different prime ministers uh in that time and untold political chaos at westminster so i guess my task has been to try and uh make sense of that but not from a sort of westminster perspective because i think there's a lot of newsletters and journalists who do a great job analyzing it all from in terms of what's going on you know, it, 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 at the heart of it, but I guess it, it, it matters how these big political developments play out matters a lot to people uh, in the north and it, it, uh, and and you know the country at large, obviously. And I think it often gets forgotten what the impact of some of these things uh, is on 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 the country uh, at large. So I think it's been very fascinating and 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 challenging. I think to try and sort of focus on how things like the pandemic say uh, and you know the the say for example the uh, how the extent to which children have lost out on educational opportunities during the pandemic like there was a big regional north south element uh, to that and and so i guess it's what i've been trying to do is focus on those sorts of things those kind of issues while the sort of the palace intrigue and the Westminster gossip has been has been going on. It's and it's not always easy, but I, I like to think we've done a reasonably good job of it so far. And you know, we, we're two years into the Northern Agenda project, and we have you know thousands of people read the newsletter every day. We've got the great podcast, which you you know you help to help to produce, and we've got a, had a few you know quite notable things happen uh, that we've that we've achieved over over the last two years so it, it's been it's been challenging and fascinating and I'm yeah I'm quite proud of what we've done what we've done so far well there's one word that you certainly couldn't describe the political situation right now and that's boring you know the, the saying may you live in interesting times well that sounds like, like a bit of a curse right now but plenty of material to report on I suppose I mean what have you learned over the past two years doing the newsletter and the podcast um, well, I think, I mean, I guess I kind of knew this a little bit already going into it. My previous job was at the, the Yorkshire Post uh, newspaper, which is a, a newspaper which covers a big du- patch of five million people in Yorkshire. And Yorkshire is a very diverse region. You have big cities, small towns, coastal 
communities, uh, rural areas, everything in between. And I think the North as a whole is 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 like that, but but much much more so. And I think it's just um, getting a. I guess I've I've learned a lot about the different parts of Northern England, which I perhaps didn't know quite as much about before, and you know what the big issues are there and just the i guess the diversity of northern england is never and 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 the politics of it never see still still surprise me and interest me uh now because i think it's easy if you're not in the north to sort of distill northern politics down to some quite broad stereotypes and i think maybe that changed a little bit after the 2019 election because everyone started caring a bit more about what you know, people in in Wakefield and Bolsover and uh, and Bishop Auckland were thinking, but I think perhaps it, there's still a sort of relatively cliched view uh, in some quarters about Northern England. But actually, you know, the the, the North of England is as diverse as uh, as the country is, and you know, you got Manchester is is as a city is thriving in a way that you know really no other part of the country other than London. Uh, London is, but then at the same time, you've got, you know, very more traditionally sort of affluent areas in the likes of, I don't know, Cheshire and Harrogate, which have their own issues to deal with. And then on the coast, you've got a whole other set of, whole other set of challenges. So the diversity of the North is, is one thing. But having said that, at the same time, the North does have some sort of common uh, issues and challenges. And I guess if it didn't, the, that's kind of the reason why the northern agenda exists to um to fly the flag for people who are attempting to tackle these common challenges such as you know it's quite boring but you know the, the economic productivity which is quite a dull term but actually it just means the amount of the the average person in the north contributes to the economy and that comes down to a whole load of things like skills and transport uh, and uh, you know education and it, it, and th- these are all the things that we talk about all the time and there's still if you look at you know the, the 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 figures don't lie in this respect and they still tell a story of the north as a whole you know not not being allowed to the people in the north not getting the opportunities to shine uh, and make the most of their lives in the way in the way that people in some other parts of the country uh, do. Uh, and and I guess that is you know a large part of the reason why the leveling up agenda came into being, and you know whether it still remains a you know a focus of the government. I guess that that is a matter of debate, but it, that that's that's such a big thing. Well, that's the next question I was going to ask you. You know, you, you were talking about sort of back in twenty nineteen, um, the North was promised up milk and honey essentially, um, and um, you know. And the, you know the leveling up agenda was the flagship um, agenda of the Johnsonian gov- government, but um, is the North still at the top of the political agenda? Do you think three prime ministers later? Um, well, it's definitely still true that there's no way the Conservatives will be able to get back into power at the next election next year without winning back most of winning again most of those seats that they won. In 2019, just yeah, you know, the, the the Westminster arithmetic makes that fairly obvious. But uh, if you look at the polling, it's quite clear to see that the Conservatives are struggling. They're still 20 points down, aren't they, nationally? And they're so that which means they're struggling all over the country, not just in the north of England, but also in you know in the home counties where they're not. It's a whole different set. Voters have a whole different set of priorities, and the Conservatives are worried about losing to. The Liberal Democrats, uh, rather than losing to Labour, who who is their op- make the main opposition up here. So I think that, um, and, and plus also in terms of policy, like we're hearing a lot less about levelling up, which is obviously you know the, the agenda that Boris Johnson launched to try and uh, win over Northern voters. We don't hear so much of that these days, and I think that is in some respect because. There's so many other things that the government is trying to tackle, you know, cost of living crisis, inflation, small votes, which you hear so much about, the collapse of our public services. You know, the, the country's, you know, falling apart, really, uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. And and levelling up is such a big, complicated and potentially expensive area. It, it, it's not getting the, the attention that it 
it used to get. And obviously it's not, levelling up is not one of Rishi Sunak's five missions that he set out as prime minister. Although I guess you could argue it kind of comes under growing the economy, which is one of the five missions. And I think it's not central to his premiership in the way that it was with Boris Johnson. But obviously there's an election around the corner, 2024, uh, I think inevitably, because you know the MPs who want to get back in, in these northern seats, they're going to be flying the flag for what they think levelling up has achieved. So I think the north will come back into focus. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I definitely would like to see it. It is it, perhaps not quite as high in the political agenda as it maybe was four years ago. I mean, can we can you even sort of uh, define level or not? Because it, for the first couple of years, well, you know, when it was first sort of used by Johnson, it was this general phrase, and then they tried to define it in the white paper. What's your, what's your understanding of it? The leveling up white paper has done a pretty good job of uh, defining it. I mean, I guess at its heart, it is, and, and you know, this is something that Boris Johnson has has said: the fact that uh, talent. Uh, and ability is distributed equally around the country, but opportunities to take advantage of that talent uh, are are not distributed equally. And for many parts of the country, a large proportion of which are in the north, you have to uh, leave where you live to go and uh, and, and better yourself, um, which is obviously a tremendous waste of human human potential. So levelling up at its heart is trying to... Uh, tackle that those regional inequalities where um you know people in for example Middlesbrough or um or parts of Lancashire say have far fewer opportunities to succeed than someone who lives in in the greater London greater London area but I guess so that I think I think most people would agree that that is a is a terrible situation that and, it, and it's been the case for years, if not decades, like that that gap between, you know, some parts of the, the North and Greater London has been widening for, for decades. It's something that everyone has been aware of for a long time. But I guess what the levelling up white paper did was uh, in, in 400 very lengthy, lengthy pages, which included sections on the Medicis in Italy and uh, things like that, it, 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 it sort of spelled out what needs to happen the, the the many factors that go into leveling up and it's not one simple one simple thing like it it, it, it goes back to a whole raft of different things all of which have to be done at the same time which is what makes it such a big challenge and is what uh, you know in some respects it it's a, it's a, a task that is going to take decades to fulfil and billions and billions of, of pounds, and I guess the with the political system the way it is, where you get a, you know prime ministers and governments changing so quickly, and and they've all got different sets of priorities. Whether this sort of the the the, the longer term nature of levelling up, whether that will whether that will survive the sort of chop and change of politics, that's I think that's what concerns me quite a lot. I mean, we, we can hear in the background in your house there, there's a bit of work going on and there's a bit of work going on in, in my house as well. I mean, you know, t- talking of work going on, uh, have we seen any sort of big developments in the North? Have we seen, you know, the builders come in and any viable change that, that you know, that the government can sell next year in the election? Um, I mean, I think there's been a few ups and a few downs in terms of, in terms of leveling up, obviously, in terms like the, I guess one of the big sort of flagship things that haven't hasn't happened in the way that we all hope was Northern Powerhouse Rail, and that was a subject of one of our um, uh, one of the Northern Agenda's sort of things I'm most proud of. Actually, uh, uh, we before um, the big announcement about Northern Powerhouse Rail was made, we uh, organised a set of front pages that were put out by. Titles like the Manchester Evening News and the Newcastle Chronicle, um, sort of urging Boris Johnson not to break his promises on rail. And you might remember one of the first things he did as prime minister was a big speech in Manchester where he promised there would be a new high speed rail line between Leeds and Manchester. Um, and that, uh, and but then as things went on, that, that, that people started to get worried that 
that promise wasn't going to be kept. And lo and behold, it hasn't hasn't been kept. Uh, sadly, there is going to be some new railway line between Leeds and Manchester, but not a whole new line. It's going to stop somewhere in the middle of West Yorkshire, uh, and Leeds isn't going to get and isn't 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 going to get any of it. So that's been a big letdown. And I guess you know it hints, I suppose, at the other priorities that the government has in terms of spending its money not on big infrastructure projects, but on you know tightening the. On, on the state of the public finances with Rishi Sunak as chancellor, like he, he, the worry is that these big projects aren't going to get the same sort of support as when Boris Johnson was prime minister. But the, I guess on the more positive side, there are quite a lot of reasons to be positive. And, you know, we hear a lot about the net zero uh, agenda and, you know, the need to cut our carbon emissions and create green jobs and I think there's every reason to believe that the north of England is going to be at the heart of that if you look at Teesside um if you look at the Humber region if you look at uh the northwest sort of Merseyside with with its tidal power there's a lot of pioneering sort of really great work going on to on things like hydrogen carbon capture and storage uh wind farms all of which are going to you know bring our carbon emissions down but they're also going to uh you know, create new, uh, highly skilled, hopefully well-paid jobs in areas which did used to have a lot of heavy industry, polluting heavy industry, and that though you know that that has seeped away, and this could be a, you know the, the the dawn of a new third industrial revolution. That's what people are are talking about in these areas. To and it could and it could all be happening in the north of England. And I think that that the one other thing I guess which is a reason to feel hopeful that has happened under this government is the uh, continued sort of progress of of devolution, which again is something that a lot of people would probably find quite boring, and a lot of it is quite procedural and uh, perhaps not of interest. But I guess at the heart of it is the fact that we now have metro mayors, regional leaders like Andy Burnham and uh, yeah, Steve Rotherham in the Tees Valley, Ben Houchin. Uh, who are the recognisable faces of their regions, uh, and they, uh, they, they, the government, I think, is starting to see the argument now that if levelling up is to happen, uh, it, it, it can't be them, the, gov- the central government in Whitehall, dictating it. It has to be done at regional level by these metro mayors who have democratic legitimacy, and so that. I mean, the reality is at the moment that a lot of mayors don't have a huge amount of power or clout to get things done, but that is changing. And the most recent development on that, obviously, was uh, Andy Burnham, the Greater Manchester Mayor, has had this trailblazer devolution deal, uh, which hands him a whole load of new powers and money from uh, from central government. He didn't get everything he wanted, but he does. He will get a very big um, pot of money that he can spend as he sees fit on Greater Manchester. He doesn't need to bid for the bid to the government as part of the, the sort of Hunger Games style bidding wars that we hear so much about. And I think that direction of travel, if you excuse the jargon, is is is, is quite encouraging. And I, I think um, it, it it bodes well that everyone understands that this is what needs to happen. And you know, it will be it may maybe in five years' time it will be we'll be asking questions about has Andy Burnham delivered, has Steve Rotherham or Ben Houchin delivered, rather than has the government delivered, which I think is a, a good a good good direction to be going in. You know, you say that transporting was a highlight of the, the two years uh, so far, the journey so far as it were, the story so far. Are there any sort of other favourite moments, favourite things you've covered or any favourite guests on the podcasts, favourite colleagues that you've worked with, people who edit you and produce you? Well, obviously, Dan, you are num- number one in terms of my colleagues, in terms of making me, make, taking all my ums and ahs out that I say on the podcast every week and making me sound vaguely, vaguely coherent. That is always much appreciated. Um, but, I mean, in terms of highlights, yeah, the train spotting front pages were really great and it was i have to credit uh, our westminster editor at the time dan o'donoghue who came up with the idea of mocking up the likes of boris johnson michael go rishi sunak as characters from uh from train spotting and that that front page uh you know it was voted best front page of the year 
uh, by one website and it really had a big impact. I mean, we've done a couple of other um, similar sort of united front pages across regional uh, press. One was urging Michael Gove, uh, don't leave us behind. And it was on behalf of the sort of children in the poorest parts of the North. And then a bit later, we did another one um, saying to Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, who were battling it out for um, for the keys to number 10, not to turn their backs uh, on the North. And we've got some great designers uh, who, who we work with, uh, who, who put together some really eye-catching designs for that. And I think it was great that, you know, the regional press who often, you know, obviously all the different titles and areas of the North have their own things that they, they care about, their own agendas, but they were able to sort of come together as one for this purpose, which was, uh, which was great. Um, I mean, in terms of the newsletter we've done, I've been quite proud of some of the work we've done, sort of looking at subjects and using data to sort of uh, look at subjects in a slightly different way and subjects that perhaps don't get as much attention, things like um, the the amount that our, our town halls spend on consultants um, bidding for this levelling up cash. One of my colleagues, David Dubas Fisher, did a great bit of data analysis that we turned into a story about this begging bowl, begging bowl culture. I and mean, we used a, a begging bowl cartoon that our cartoonist, Graham Bandera, uh, who, who's been a fantastic addition, uh, he, he put together, uh, which was very effective. And similarly, um, you know, looking at the North-South divide on um, you know, the way asylum seekers are distributed around the country, uh, again, using data in a way that I think perhaps isn't done done that much. That was great. Um, I'm very proud of that. Um, and obviously, uh, interviewing Michael Gove in the back of a taxi, uh, travelling through Manchester, was uh, was uh, which happened at the Convention of the North a bit earlier in the, in the year. We we'd we'd hoped. Well, we'd been we'd promised an interview with Michael Gove, but as always, he was running late. He'd had a meeting with Andy Burnham, and basically, he didn't have any time for a sit down interview. So the only option was for me to hop in. The taxi with him uh, as it went from the uh, convention centre in Manchester to the station and interview him on the way. And I was rather concerned about uh, whether the audio equipment would work and whether it would sound okay. And luckily, it did. Uh, and I, I tried to teach you how to use the Zoom recorder um, in about thirty seconds, which you did admirably. To be honest with you, you did a great job with it. Well, it turns out it's just a case of pressing pressing a button to start recording and then pressing another button to stop recording. So even I, even I can master that. So the job's much more than that, Rob. Obviously, but... <laughs> <laughs> that particular bit of equipment is was was quite easy to use. But uh, it turned out the the Manchester traffic worked in my favour uh, on on that day because uh, I thought I'd only get ten minutes, uh, but actually it was more like twenty because the traffic slowed us down so much. So. Uh, that that works that worked well and um yeah and, and it, it turned into a good interview so i think yeah those have been a, a few of my a few of my highlights perfect yeah a bit of role reversal though you know you have to do the producing job i've had to do the presenting job today but thankfully i'm giving you back the microphone now for you to to carry on and um you are speaking or have spoken to a really fascinating guest next uh, dr marie o'brien and she talks about the fantastic work that liverpool has done over the years to help with um, vaccinations. But obviously you put it better yourself in the introduction, which everyone is just going to hear now. 